Good evening, everyone. I thank you, all of you for joining us today for this webinar on ex vivo organ preservation, new clinical and ex experimental opportunities. My name is Ugolino Livi. I'm a full professor of cardiac surgery at the University of Udine Medical School in Italy. This uh, ex vivo heart perfusion, uh, the ex vivo heart perfusion is perhaps the most uh, intriguing innovation that has been introduced in the heart transplantation in the last 20 years. This session aims to size the opportunities of, offered by the ex vivo heart preservation, drawing inspiration from the practice of international experts. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sumner. She's a, a cardiothoracic surgeon at the University Hospital in Heidelberg, Germany. And she's co-chairing the session. Dr. Sammer. Thank you, Professor Levy, for this um, kind introduction and welcome everyone to this um, webinar on um, ex vivo organ perfusion, um, in which we will try to look beyond just the preservation, but also the therapeutical opportunities that, um, that we have um, through this new technique of ex vivo organ perfusion. Um, I think... Um, it's been a really exciting um, decade in the past, and we are now moving forward from um, achieving great preservation results in, 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 in thoracic organ transplantation and moving forward to uh, really uh, using this platform for, um, for um, interventional um, approaches. Um, and I'm really looking forward um, to hearing the presentations here today. This um, webinar yeah. is uh, one of the many activities organized uh, around one uh, of the most exciting topics in transplantation, machine perfusion. For this edition of the Congress, uh, ISOT uh, has prepared the all machine perfusion track, uh, which will be composed by, from series of webinars prior to the Congress, uh, as well as uh, multiple sessions delivered during ISOT Congress in Milan, together with Machine Perfusion Wet Lab. We are happy to join this discussion on Machine Perfusion for Heart. I think we are ready to start. I think we are. Um, before we get started, I want to encourage everybody to post questions in the Q&A field um, in, in your Zoom um, screen. Um, and once we've heard all um, four um, presentations, um, we'll have a QA and a um, session with everyone. Um, so without any delay, I would like to introduce Fabio Jus um, from Hanover, Germany. He is a cardiothoracic surgeon specializing in um, <clears throat> heart and lung transplantation. And the title of his talk is From Organ Preservation to Quality Assessment. Fabio, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, just a moment. I have to... Yes. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation. And um, yeah, I would like to uh, present you in 10 minutes just an overview of uh, um, the different uh, uh, platforms the, uh, that we uh, have at the disposition to, for machine perfusion. I have uh, 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 a conflict of interest with the bio test, but not with other um, uh, entities. So um, there are, for the heart and for the lung uh, uh, transplantation, we have uh, different platforms. For the heart, we have at the moment just uh, one platform is the Transmedic OCS Heart. For the lung, we have three platforms, um, but why we uh, uh, why we uh, use uh, machine perfusion in uh, uh, organ transplantation. At the end, uh, most important for three reasons, to avoid cold ischemic time, to improve uh, the organ donor pool, mm -hmm. and uh, to have a chance uh, to e evaluate properly uh, the quality of the um, uh, donor organs. We know that uh, uh, cold ischemic time is not 
it's too bad for the organs. So for in, especially for the heart, we have always, uh, we have been told we have not to pass uh, over uh, four or five hours uh, uh, cold ischemic time. Then you have a ris risk of primary graft dysfunction and bad outcomes. So in the past uh, was uh, for this reason developed the uh, OCS heart, as I told before, uh, told before is the only platform for uh, heart preservation. Um, I think that many of us uh, know this system, uh, so I don't uh, uh, talk about uh, the instrumentation and uh, the uh, different mode of preservation. Um, it but the OCS heart allows a, a complete evaluation of the heart because we have many, we can uh, continually monitor many parameters, for example, the pump flow, the coronary flow, the aortic pressure, the temperature, the pulmonary pressure, and so on. So we have a complete uh, uh, evaluation of the heart, uh, of the harvested heart. And then we, uh, through the arterial and venous lactate levels, we can have a really um, a, a good idea if our heart is doing, is performing uh, good or bad uh, during uh, uh, machine perfusion. Uh, there is uh, um, by now, uh, enough evidence that uh, uh, the use of machine perfusion in uh, um, uh, heart transplantation makes sense. Uh, for example, the first trial published was the PROCEED trial, a multi-center trial, and um, in this uh, uh, study it was shown the non-inferiority of the machine perfusion in heart transplantation in uh, comparison to the um, uh, uh, standard perfusion technique. Uh, also, in this case, we have a longer out of body time, but uh, uh, we um, uh, the uh, results uh, at the end were comparable. Uh, the especially survival was comparable at uh, thirty days after transplantation between machine perfusion and standard uh, um, preservation. Uh, this was the same also for. Uh, extended uh, criteria donor or for high risk recipients. Also in this case, there was no difference between the two groups and the OCS, uh, so the machine perfusion really helped uh, treating these uh, complex patients and uh, um, uh, extended uh, criteria donors. And moving uh, on uh, um, also with uh, the development uh, of the uh, donor effort circulatory death, also in this case, the, uh, the machine perfusion could really be a, a big uh, tool to uh, uh, um, uh, help evaluating these particular uh, donors. And by now, more than 300 uh, successful DCD heart transplantation have been performed using this machine perfusion technique, technique uh, worldwide. Uh, what uh, we have to evaluate uh, uh, donor heart function. Yes, we have all the previous parameters, but the lactate levels at the, um, the arterial and the venous uh, lactate levels are really important uh, to evaluate uh, the organ function. And this parameter remains the most important uh, uh, um, parameters uh, during uh, the evaluation of the perfuse heart. And, uh, we have also one case, it was uh, performed in Kazakhstan of uh, uh, even 17 hours perfusion and the heart was transplanted and went well also at three years follow up. So it makes sense heart uh, to, to uh, um, uh, treat a, a donor hearts with machine perfusion and we can have a good idea of the quality of the organs we are going to transplant and we can also ex potentially expand uh, the uh, organ donor pool. Mo moving to the um, lung transplantation, in this case the focus is made somehow different because yes we uh, have also in this case uh, to expand the potential donor pool and in the um, 
for for the lung is uh, uh, more important maybe also than for the heart but also in the lung we have to try to avoid the development of primary graft dysfunction which is uh, a um, really big problem after lung transplantation and uh, uh, is usually correlated also with uh, early uh, mortality and also with long-term development of uh, chronic allograft dysfunction. So every system is welcome to uh, 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 diminish, to uh, decrease the prevalence of this complication after lung transplantation. In this case, there are uh, three systems uh, available, standard or static EVLP, ex vivo lung perfusion or portable EVLP. There is a, a difference between these two techniques. Um, uh, the, um, with the portable EVLP, uh, we have the chance to reduce the uh, is uh, cold ischemic time to a minimum. In the other case, we have uh, before to preserve the organs in the, uh, the same te technique as uh, usually with uh, a cold perfusion, and then the organs are usually evaluated for uh, usually four, six hours at the in, uh, impl uh, implantation center, and then to decide if these organs are good or not to be uh, transplanted. Three um, protocols. Lund, OCS, and Toronto have been used uh, in the last year. Um, um, there are differences uh, between uh, the three uh, protocols. The most important, I think, it was this, the OCS is the only portable platform, and the other two uh, uh, platforms are static. Obviously, the other two techniques have been especially development developed to evaluate uh, extended donor uh, criteria um, uh, lungs uh, the first experience was the experience of uh, toronto it was uh, published in 2011 and the, the colleagues evaluated um, um, extended criteria donor as defined as for example uh, low po2 at retrieval or pulmonary edema or a transfusion of uh, um, uh, 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 many uh, units of blood uh, or DCD donors. And those in this case, they compare two groups, uh, 20 versus more than 100 patients, and they show that uh, the uh, incidence of uh, um, uh, primary graft dysfunction at, uh, uh, after uh, transplantation was not different between uh, the two groups, uh, even if obviously the, these 20 lungs were from uh, extended criteria donors, and even at uh, 24 hours there was a uh, um, better uh, um, uh, prevalence of, uh, uh, of um, a better um, a better results uh, for the lungs preserved with uh, EVLP. Um, another recent uh, uh, study from Toronto, uh, it, was, um, it has been recently published in Journal of Oral Transplantation. So they have a really big experience uh, with EVLP and uh, they are now uh, uh, able to even to predict uh, which organs are uh, at risk of develop, uh, developing uh, PGD after transplantation and uh, uh, on the base of uh, the levels of interleukin-6 and interleukin-8 uh, also combined with the PO2 after uh, uh, transplant uh, at retrieval. Also, the Vienna group published uh, uh, some years ago the experience with uh, uh, the uh, static EVLP, also in this case, um, good results, uh, non inferiority between regular donors and uh, preserved with uh, EVLP and uh, regular donors preserved with standard uh, conservation. And uh, also in this case, there was no difference in the PGD uh, uh, prevalence after transplantation, but this prevalence was even uh, uh, somehow better in patients uh, uh, who receive a lung preserved with uh, EVLP. 
uh, coming to the OCS experience, as I told you before, the OCS is a, a portable system. In this case, there is um, the non-inferiority was uh, uh, tested by the INSPIRE trial. Also, in this case, uh, uh, lungs uh, standard lungs preserved with OCS um, showed even a better uh, um, pr uh, prevalence of uh, PGD after transplantation. Um, uh, also, in this case, there was, for example, uh, a prevalence of PGD of 70.7 against 29.7%. It was a really good result uh, and without a difference but, um, uh, about, uh, of uh, survival between two groups. But obviously, we have the follow-up until one year. Talking about uh, extended criteria donor, also in this case with the EXPAND trial showed that uh, uh, even with uh, uh, a longer out of body time and is, um, uh, of the uh, uh, preserved do donors, we have good results. In this case, it was important because 87% uh, of the uh, um, preserved lungs were uh, transplanted. So the donor pool was uh, really expanding uh, by the use of uh, OCS. So by, conclu by concluding uh, for the lung, obviously EVLP um, might really become a standard procedure in lung transplantation in many centers, for example, uh, in Toronto has really become a, um, a standard procedure. Um, obviously we have, we can, with EPLP expand our donor pool and this really important lung transplantation where uh, um, many organs may be rejected just for uh, um, pneumonia or bad cases, gas exchange. Uh, we have uh, uh, platforms to reduce significantly the incidence of PGD uh, uh, after transplantation and uh, we will see in the future if uh, these improvements uh, will reduce uh, the uh, um, uh, incidence of chronic lung allograft dysfunction. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, for uh, open to questions. Fabio. Very interesting talk, many thanks. Uh, I think there will be a lot of uh, questions uh, around your topic, but uh, we, we, we need to move on. I, I pass uh, uh, to the next speaker and uh, will be my colleague, uh, Dr. Sandro Sponga, working uh, is a cardiothoracic surgeon at the uh, University of Udine. Uh, Sandro? Yeah. Are you ready? Mm, yes, just one moment. We have some problem to share the screen. Now seems okay. You need to start? Okay, that's fine. Uh, good evening and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, when uh, you speak about marginal cardiac donors and ex vivo perfusion, of course you have to mention the expand trial that demonstrates that uh, you can uh, reduce the ischemic time to one hour and a half uh, and um, you can reduce the ischemic time independently from the transport time. And the same trial demonstrated that reducing the ischemic time, you can uh, obtain good results and the low rate of PGD, uh, even with marginal donors. Apart from uh, longer uh, ischemic time, there are other characteristics that can identify marginal donors. For example, is age and uh, you can see how uh, in Europe the mean age of the donors are increasing. Left ventricular hypertrophy is important beca because it can impact on survival and on symptoms. Coronary artery disease uh, is frequent in old donors and uh, uh, in this 
in the in, in patient in case when you have not an available cath lab you can put uh, the organ in the organ care system to be transported uh, and studied in your hospital myocardial bridge can be a problem uh, this was uh, a donor that has a myocardial bridge and uh, borderline troponin and we could demonstrate with uh, the ex vivo perfusion used in a synchron way that the bridge gave, gave no functional problem. And so we transplanted with good success this, door, this, um, this graft. In some donors, you need some time to wait, for example, for a biopsy. And uh, if you employ the perfusion, you can uh, wait for the answer of the biopsy without increasing the ischemic time. Uh, some donors can be uh, non-standard because uh, of a cardiac arrest, for example. In this picture on the left, you can see how after a brief uh, uh, cardiac arrest in a marginal donor, uh, there is a complete disarray of the myocardial structure. And how after four hours of uh, perfusion, the, there is a perfect reconditioning of the myocardial structure. This is our uh, overall experience with uh, ex vivo perfusion. And um, you can uh, notice how, most, how in most of our case, we employed marginal donors. We recently published the, this experience of marginal donors, um, comparing results with ex vivo perfusion and uh, uh, cold storage. And to avoid possible bias, uh, we excluded all cases uh, where the graft were implanted in uh, uh, non-standard patients. For example, patient with VAD or patient with ECMO. You can see that uh, um, mm, this donor were all donor with coronary artery disease uh, in most cases and with cardiac arrest. Um, while uh, uh, recipients were standard patients uh, without difference between the two groups. We found that uh, with ex vivo perfusion, the ischemic time was shorter, and so uh, we could uh, use a shorter perfusion time uh, and uh, uh, shorter cardiopulmonary bypass, shorter sh surgical time. Uh, in ex vivo perfusion, we had a um, reduced the rate of overall complication, mechanical ventilation. We had 0% of patients needing ECMO with primary graft dysfunction and no patient that died the 30 day. And even and uh, uh, long-term results were good. We routinely perform a biopsy uh, when we harvest the heart before implantation and before reperfusion. And uh, we analyzed this biopsy. Um, we found that uh, there was uh, uh, less uh, uh, parking expression in these uh, organs, and this means that there was uh, a, a reduced uh, reduce, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. In ex vivo perfusion, there was less apoptosis and uh, a tendency to less contraction band, that means less necrosis. We analyzed the nanoparticles that are uh, a, a way to identify cell, uh, cellular membrane damage, and we found that there was less nanoparticle and smaller nanoparticle. That means that if you transport the organ with uh, ex vivo perfusion, you uh, reduce the damage of the myocyte. And the electron microscopy, you can see on the upper part of uh, the slides that there are a better sarcomeric structure that are better um, preserved. And in the lower part, you can see the mitochondria that are more regular, better preserved with normal and parallel crystal terminals. Uh, we learned a lot, uh, even by the, the eight graph that we didn't uh, utilize. Um, all these were marginal grafts, and we performed in all these graft biopsy and pathological um, evaluation. This is the first uh, uh, case. This is the graft uh, that was harvested by a, a young lady that died because of a car accident. Um, 
because of the 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 young uh, age, we didn't perform coronary angiography in the donor. But uh, uh, later, during uh, uh, the uh, OCS transport, uh, the lactate revealed that the organ was not idoneous for transplantation. And then at the uh, pathological evaluation, we found that there was uh, a, a traumatic coronary dissection. And so thanks to the organ care system, we could avoid a sure primary graft dysfunction. The KC was a uh, donor with a mild aortic regurgitation and mild coronary uh, artery disease, demonstrated coronary geography. But uh, uh, when uh, the organ care system demonstrates uh, an increased lactate uh, with uh, a worse trend, uh, and uh, in, uh, in the OCS, the uh, aortic regurgitation seems to be important, uh, we discharged this art and we analyzed the pathological examination. We found that there was a uh, very poor leaflet coaptation and uh, the atherosclerosis of the LID was very important. In the third the marginal graft tested and discarded uh, with OCS, uh, um, we found uh, at the uh, biopsy that there was uh, a lot of uh, a contraction band that is a sign of diffuse cell necrosis. And so we decide not to employ this graft, but we decide to perform a test, a test to simulate a VCD. Uh, VCD is considered unfeasible in Italy because we have a no touch period of 20 minutes. Uh, to, to perform this test, we arrest the, 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 the device. After some minutes, the, the art stops. Then we uh, we, we waited for 30 minutes, 20 minutes more, 10 minutes to put in the OCS, we estimated. And you can see that after um, restarting the machine, uh, the, the heart begin again to beat. And much better after 30 minutes of reperfusion, you can see that there is a, a quite normal reperfusion. We made a lot of biopsy on this uh, art, but the most important is that one at 60 minutes. And you can see that on this biopsy, uh, uh, optic uh, microscopy and electron microscopy, there are a um, sufficient myocardial preservation and recovery. And for the reason, we believe that maybe we can in the future do DCD even in Italy, even with 20 minute of uh, no touch period. Uh, the fourth case permit me to uh, make some consideration about uh, uh, reconditioning. Uh, usually, uh, it's a common thought that uh, uh, the graft can recover inside the machine, inside the OCS. And so there is a tendency to maintain the heart uh, for many hours uh, inside the, the organ care system. But I believe that it's not uh, a good idea uh, to, to maintain a perfusion for more than five, six hours. Because as you can see in this slide, after nine hours, there are more um, cellular edema and capillary hemorrhage. In conclusion, exo perfusion permits a safe evaluation of the marginal donor, excluding non-suitable grafts. It allows more stable hemodynamic condition after transplant, reducing complication and permitting to obtain optimal survival even in marginal donor. The path pathological finding uh, show a tendency to better myocardial protection. I would like to thank all people that gave these images and data to me and you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Spanja. Um, very interesting and impressive cases um, that you that you um, um, presented to us. Our next speaker is um, Professor James McCulley, who is a professor of surgery at Boston Children's Hospital, and he's going to speak about um, um, recently um, developed a novel approach of using autologous mitochondrial uh, mito um, um, transplantation um, in cardiac protection. Um, professor McCulley.
Okay, pardon me, I was muted there. Um, approximately 15 years ago, we proposed a novel therapeutic intervention uh, to ameliorate the deleterious effects of myocardial ischemia reperfusion injury. What we hypothesized was that we could take viable mitochondria isolated from the patient's own body from a non-ischemic area, and then deliver those mitochondria by either direct injection or by intra-arterial delivery into the ischemic organ, um, thus allowing for the rescue of myocardial cells and the restoration of myocardial function. We described this as autologous mitochondrial transplantation. Now, can somebody switch the slide there for me? I don't seem to be, able, oh, there we go. Now we've demonstrated the, uh, the uh, safety and efficacy of mitochondrial transplantation in a uh, series of papers using a regional ischemic model and a large animal models. Uh, results have consistently shown that we can preserve mitochondrial viability and we can enhance function. All of the results are here. Um, these studies have now expanded to human clinical studies in pediatric patients that have been quite effective, they're safe, and uh, we now have a four-year follow-up on that. Now, recently, um, we've used mitochondrial transplantation in uh, a DCD heart model to determine if mitochondrial transplantation could actually enhance DCD heart function and therefore expand the donor pool. To do this, uh, we have used the clinically relevant swine model. The swine we used were uh, 40 to 50 kilograms. They had a heart size of approximately 250 to 300 grams, similar to that of, of an adult human. The animals were sedated and then anesthetized, and we put femoral lines uh, for continuous mean arterial and uh, central venous pressure monitoring. Uh, we did perform a sternotomy. This is part of our animal protocols, and that was required. That's different from the DCD, but essentially we did try to mimic all DCD procedures. Um, we gave a bolus injection um, of pancaronium approximately after 15 minutes. 15 minutes was used just to get baseline measures to make sure the heart was uh, proper and, and functioning. When we, we called cessation of uh, circulation when we got no flow, in other words, when mean arterial pressure and central renal uh, venous pressure was uh, the same. At that time, we called it a no flow. Then we went into our no to touch period, which we only were required to do two minutes. Um, and then death was declared. The total warm ischemic time was extended to 20 minutes. This was used to match the St. Vincent's group time and um, to allow for comparative. Uh, the time for uh, to uh, onset of no flow was approximately 6.7 minutes in ours. That was also similar to the St. Vincent's group. Uh, the hearts remained in warm ischemic for 20 for 20 minutes, as I said. Following the 20 minutes, uh, we gave uh, cold blood del nido cardio, uh, cardioplegia. It was delivered through the right atrium and the heart was harvested and stored in cold cardioplegia for a further 10 minutes. So the warm and cold ischemic time was 30 minutes in total. Uh, during the uh, cold storage time, we uh, cannulated the aorta and inferior vena cava for exceed exit to uh, uh, blood perfusion. And we also inserted a 25 by 64 millimeter balloon into the left ventricle to allow for uh, loaded heart evaluation. For comparison, we used a sham control hearts. As you can see, the sham control parts are up here. They received no warm ischemia. Tissue for mitochondrial isolation was a, a you know, collected from the pectoralis major muscle as we usually did. Um, we then placed the hearts on our multi-mode blood perfusion uh, system for 15 minutes of collaboration, followed by two hours of loaded, uh, of unloaded uh, blood perfusion, then followed by two hours of loaded blood perfusion. Uh, hearts were paced at 80 uh, to 100 beats per minute. We used low dolbutamine throughout the reperfusion period. 
The reperfusion, uh, the perfusates, uh, we tried to optimize. This was done according to the University of Manitoba's group's recommendations. All of these data are, uh, have been uh, monitored. There were three experimental groups. Um, we had DC, we randomly assigned to all the DCD hearts uh, to receive either a 10 mil bolus of vehicle alone delivered anti-grade through the uh, through the aortic route, or they got a 10 mil bolus of vehicle containing five times 10 to the ninth mitochondria. The concentration of mitochondria was based on our previous studies where we were able to show that uh, two times 10 to the fifth to two times 10 to the sixth uh, mitochondria per gram wet weight was the optimal amount. Um, you can add more, but it really doesn't make any effect. That was given at 15 minutes, then the hearts were uh, perfused in cold reperfusion unloaded mode uh, for two hours. Um, another group of hearts received both a single injection at 15 minutes and another injection of mitochondria just prior to the loaded heart mode. The reason why we did this is we'd previously reported uh, orthotopic heart transplantation in a mouse model. Uh, that's Musk, the reference is right here. And it was shown that uh, secondary mitochondrial uh, injection actually was, was a benefit. However, the cold, uh, cold ischemic time there was 29 hours, but this was just, uh, just to make sure that we had covered all bases. This is just to show you what happens when you in inject the mitochondria. This is the unloaded heart at 15 minutes. Note that the heart is not supported here. And this is just simply to show you what the effect of the mitochondria is. The heart's paced at 80 to 100 beats per minute. This is when we're delivering the mitochondria, the loaded heart, it's being injected right in through the aortic root anti And then this is what, what you get. Once again, chron chron there's no chronotropic uh, effects. However, it's all functional effects. Once again, this is an unsupported heart, simply to show you what, what happens. This is that. Okay, so this is our results uh, from both the loaded and in the uh, unloaded phase. You can see the, here that the aortic pressure for both uh, for all the hearts, either for the serial injection, the vehicle, single, or sham, were all the same. Coronary blood flow was similar in all the models, as was the hemoglobin contained in the arterial. Uh, sham hearts that received nothing are always shown here in blue, and the DCD hearts that are shown in black. When we looked at uh, left ventricular developed pressure, and this, of course, is in the loaded heart, what we found was that in the vehicle heart that received nothing other than, uh, other than the vehicle alone, we got a decrease in uh, left ventricular developed pressure over a period of time. However, in giving either a serial injection or a single injection of mitochondria, really maintained function similar to that as what we got in the sham heart with no warm ischemia whatsoever. This was uh, mimicked again what's in with DPDT, where there was no significant difference between the sham hearts and those receiving mitochondria either serially or uh, uh, singly. If we look at fractional shortening, you can see during, once again, in the loaded heart, you can see that here is in the uh, vehicle heart that warm, 20 minutes of warm ischemia, you get a decrease in the fractional shortening. However, when as compared to the sham heart with no ischemia, either serial injection or single ejection of mitochondria significantly enhanced the function. Now, we did measure lact arterial lactates in all our groups. And unfortunately, we were unable to see any difference in the arterial lactates. And we were unable to get a good correlation between left ventricular developed pressure and lactate concentration. However, what we did get was a correlation between left ventricular developed pressure and myocardial oxygen consumption. What we found was, whereas myocardial oxygen consumption decreases, here is the loaded heart uh, in the um, vehicle only group, 
here is the uh, sham control heart. Myocardial oxygen consumption was preserved with mitochondria throughout this time period. So if we had a good heart, it was associated with that better association with MVO2 than, um, than with lactate. The uh, use of uh, mitochondria, as we've shown before, also preserves uh, cellular viability. Here you can see in the vehicle heart, you can see this is just an H and E staining. You can see the damage inflicted. Here's the sham heart, which you know is very, very controlled. Um, not, whereas in the serial and the single injections, there's really no damage whatsoever to the myocardium. Just to uh, go on with this, we also did TTC staining of the total myocardium. This is the TTC positive or dead tissue in the uh, sham in the vehicle hearts that received 20 minutes of warm ischemia and 10 minutes of cold ischemia versus here's a single ejection and a serial injection. So there's no difference between these two groups. Here's the sham group. Essentially, there's no, uh, no injury in that. So what I hope I've shown you here, and uh, it's slight within 10 minutes, uh, but the isolation and preparation of uh, mitochondria is very rapid. We uh, can do that in less than 30 minutes. It's safe. There's no immune, autoimmune, or reaction. It can be performed right at the bedside. And uh, it is the specificity of distribution is, we've shown this before, if you put them into the coronary arteries, they only go to the heart. They don't go anywhere else. Direct injection, obviously, it just stays there. It's robust and it's clinically effective. In the DCD heart, it increases myocardial function. It enhances cellular viability. And both a single and uh, multiple injections seem, in, uh, seem to be effective. The multiple injection we have to note here is that obviously, you're not going to be able to get tissue for the secondary injection. In, the, in our model, we used swine um, uh, fibroblast cell culture to isolate the mitochondria from them. However, there's easy to, it's just as easy to get it from uh, the recipient, a piece of tissue to use it. There's no immune reaction whether you use heterologous or autologous mitochondria. So with that, I'll conclude and say thank you very much. And, Appreciate your attention. James, uh, many thanks. Uh, great talk, uh, really amazing. Uh, I think there will be a lot of questions uh, at the end of the session. Uh, I, encourage, I encourage everyone everyone to ask questions uh, and uh, to put questions and then we take uh, answer at the end of the session. Our last speaker, but definitely not the least is Prof. Professor Don Bowles, working in the Department of Surgery at the Duke University School of Medicine, USA. His talk today is going uh, to be gene therapy for organ immunomodulation prior to transplant. Dr. Bowles, please. Thank you very much. I'm having a problem. Um, can, can the previous speaker unshare his screen? Is that better? Sorry. Yes, thank you. My, my bad, thank you. Okay, this is my uh, disclosure and of uh, uh, conflict of interest. As you all know, heart transplantation significantly improves survival and quality of life for patients with end-stage heart failure, but transplant recipients do not have normal life expectancy. According to ISHLT registry data, the majority of heart transplant recipients are in their 40s or 50s, and currently survival after heart transplantation 
is about 85% at one year, 70% at five years, and 60% at 10 years. So there's a lot of room for improvement. The central issue limiting life expectancy in heart transplant patients is chronic graft rejection by recipient immune system, manifesting as coronary allograft vasculopathy or CAV. Within five years of transplantation, about one third of patients develop clinically significant CAV, increasing to about half of the patients at 10 years. The key problem is that currently available immunosuppressants do not completely block this process. And at the same time, they expose the patients to serious and sometimes life-threatening side effects such as infection and malignancy. Given the shortcomings of pharmacotherapy, our laboratory is exploring gene therapy as a method for addressing these issues. Gene therapy is the delivery of nucleic acids into a cell to treat a disease. Our lab focuses on DNA delivered using a viral vector. And after delivery, the cell's own machinery uses this DNA to produce an active protein that has some therapeutic function. Multiple types of viral vectors have been developed, including adenovirus, adeno-associated virus, um, also known as AV, and lentiviruses, and each have specific pros and cons. In order for gene therapy to be useful for heart transplant patients, we need to answer important questions. First, what gene should we deliver to the graft? And second, what is the most effective way to deliver the viral vector carrying the gene to the allograft? Several potential therapeutic genes have already been proposed, and I'm, I'm not going to focus on this in this talk, but most examples are genes that, when expressed by the graft, could have local immunosuppressive effects, which could, be better, which could better protect the graft against chronic rejection and potentially lowering the amount or even eliminating the need for immunosuppressive medicines. Examples, examples include molecules expressed within endothelial cells or cardiomyocytes, Molecules that are expressed on the surface of cells are molecules that are secreted by the cells. The question of how we would deliver viral vectors carrying genes to the heart is still a major problem. Our current, currently available methods of delivery to the heart include intravenous infusion, direct injections to the myocardium, direct infusions via coronary catheter, uh, all seem incapable of delivering genes to enough cells at a high enough levels to produce therapeutic effects. For example, the largest cardiac gene therapy trial to date was the CUPA-2 trial. This trial explored use of an AAV vector delivering a calcium regulator called CIRCA-2A using transcatheter cor coronary infusion in an effort to prevent congestive heart failure exacerbations in heart failure patients. This trial failed and one of the major issues was that there appeared to be minimal expression of the transgene in the heart. The focus of our laboratory is to currently, uh, currently is to improve cardiac gene transfer efficiency. And we are exploring the use of ex vivo perfusion as a new delivery approach for viral vector delivery. Ex vivo perfusion storage, as you well know, has emerged as a new strategy to reduce ischemic reperfusion injury associated with cold stat static storage of allografts, but we feel that it may also have several advantages as a gene therapy platform compared to current delivery methods. The closed circuit of ex vivo perfusion allows the vector to constantly circulate, recirculate, and significantly increases the contact time between the vector and the heart while also isolating the vector from off-target organs. We began testing gene delivery to a pig allograft with an adenoviral vector. And the purpose of these experiments was simply to prove that we could effectively deliver a gene to the heart using ex vivo perfusion. So the transgene that we use in these experiments was firefly luciferase. In these experiments, the heart was arrested and explanted from a donor Yorkshire pig. The ex vivo perfusion circuit was primed and a dose of 5 times 10 to the 13 adenoviral particles was added to the circuit. The allograft was then attached to the circuit and received ex vivo perfusion for two hours. After that, the heart was re-arrested, removed from the circuit, and implanted into the abdomen of a recipient pig. The pigs were su survived for five days on immunosuppression and then euthanized. A total of three such transplants using adenoviral vector was performed. 
In this study, we detected strong luciferase expression throughout the entire heart. Luciferase enzymatic activity was in general 1,000 to 10,000 fold higher in the allograft tissue compared to the native heart. Importantly, luciferase activity in the recipient, lung, liver, spleen, and muscle were within background levels. Immunostaining for luciferase confirmed the enzymatic assays as did Hugh PCR data. And these results demonstrated that ex vivo perfusion provides a very effective method for transgene delivery to a donor heart. And these results were published in scientific reports. Our next step was to test the ex vivo system using a different viral vector, adeno-associated virus instead of adenovirus. Adenovar adenovirus is known to produce very high levels of transgene expression, but only for a limited amount of time. And these figures demonstrate transgene expression in cardiomyocytes on the left and endothelial cells on the right after transduction with adenovirus with the black dots and AAV with the white dots. And therefore, um, adenovirus was a good vector to use for our proof of concept experiments, but for long-term expression of a transgene that might protect against chronic rejection, we wanted to move forward using an AAV vector. The AAV experiments that we performed are very similar to the ad experiments, but with some notable modifications. The AAV serotype or variant that we're using in our experiments is called SAS2G, and it was rationally designed in my lab and has previously been demonstrated to have highly efficient gene transfer to rat neonatal cardiomyocytes, as well as murine hearts compared to other serotypes. Given our plan to keep um, recipient pigs alive for a longer period of time, um, in these experiments, we um, chose to keep the animals alive for one month instead of just five days. We decided to use donor and recipient pigs that were um, swine leukocyte antigen or SLA matched. We have completed three of these transplants using three different doses of AV, and we have successfully survived these recipients for 30 days post transplant. We're still in the process of analyzing the specimens from our last AV transplant, but we have been able to demonstrate a high level of firefly luciferase enzymatic activity throughout the entire heart and none in the native recipient heart in the first two experiments. As expected, the gene expression is not as high as that achieved using adenovirus, um, but we expect that this level of expression will be sufficient for a therapeutic impact depending on the transgene we choose to investigate. Our results so far using AAV have been encouraging, so we have started planning our next steps. Before we can investigate whether delivery of a therapeutic transgene to an allograft can protect it from rejection, we first need to establish a rejection model in the pig because we plan to continue working with a pig heterotopic heart transplant model. The ideal model will have a controlled onset of rejection and a reproducible degree of rejection, and we plan to characterize it using clinical, histopathological, and immunopathological endpoints. Unfortunately, these experiments were put on hold due to COVID, but we are in the planning stages of our studies to begin in earnest in July and August of this year. To conclude, we have demonstrated feasibility of ex vivo heart perfusion to achieve robust and global gene expression from a viral vector in the transplanted heart and nowhere else in the body. And this sets the stage for future studies using therapeutic viral vectors to fix or repair or to improve hearts prior to transplantation. It's just the beginning, but the future looks bright in this regard. I'd like to acknowledge all the members of my uh, laboratory team, as well as support from Transmedics in the form of materials and supplies and funding from the Duke Transplant Center. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Don. Um, very impressive um, technique that, that you showed us. And thank you um, to all the other present um, presenters for their um, presentations. Um, there is actually one question in the Q&A um, for um, Professor McCulley. Um, um, and it, the question is, does mitochondria transplant trigger immune response? So maybe you can um, answer this question. Uh, well, I know we're short for time, but uh, the quick answer is no. Uh, we've done this uh, 
many times uh, where there's no immune reaction and there is no autoimmune reaction. We published a paper, uh, Ramirez Barbieri is the first author, uh, done this in the mouth with, mouse with uh, multiple doses, et cetera. Um, there is no in, immune response. We've actually, we actually use human mitochondria inside a uh, pig heart and in a rabbit heart in order to track the mitochondria over a period of time, uh, in order to tell the transplanted mitochondria from the native mitochondria who use the human mitochondria, mainly because they have a specific antibody that reacts only with the human. We've left them inside a pig heart and in a rabbit heart for 28 days. The hearts are perfectly fine. There's been no immune reaction whatsoever uh, on any of those animals. Multiplex analysis shows nothing whatsoever. So the quick answer for that is no. Thank you. May, may I ask one question? Um, um, because I, have you seen any adverse events such as like arrhythmias um, after, after um, putting it in the aortic root or any other clots or formation? No, there's none. We've looked at that intensively. We've either delivered, if you deliver it by uh, interarterially or by direct injection, there are no, there's no uh, a, a severe, serious adverse events. We have actually had no adverse events whatsoever. Thank you. Yeah. Fabio, I, I got a question for you. Uh, as you know, there is a, a lot of a discussion about uh, the what is preferable, the static uh, ex vivo lamp preservation or portable ex vivo lamp preservation, the Toronto experience against other experience as uh, your experience. In, uh, have you demonstrated an another uh, a reduction of PGD in uh, with uh, AVLP portable with OCS? That's right. In, in uh, and uh, the expectation uh, is uh, to reduce also the uh, cloud uh, in the long run. Have you any data on it uh, at the moment? As I have only the data in an offer from an offer. Obviously, it's not the complete uh, Inspire cord. Yeah, we have, uh, I think, now three, four years follow up. Uh, there is still no difference between the two groups. You know? Obviously, there are only this is only a small, a small group of a bigger cord. And in the future, the um, the um, uh, follow up of the wall inspire and expand cord is going on in all centers. So I mean, then uh, in the next future, probably they have to be put together all the centers again and check if. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, what the results are really. You mean you need more time to verify? We have, we have the effect. We have overall uh, um, between Inspire, Pilot, uh, and uh, Expand uh, um, 67 patients. Obviously, it, to perform a comparison and uh, to 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 have a conclusion, a statistically robust conclusion, you need uh, all the court of all the centers. Okay, James, uh, I got uh, just a few questions for you. Uh, for, uh, you know, do you think uh, any application uh, in uh, the human setting? Uh, and uh, what, what, what patients, uh, which patient do you think uh, could be benefit uh, from this uh, technique, I mean, uh, this procedure? And uh, uh, how many mitochondria do you need? If it will, will, will be possible to inject uh, intravenous, intravenously the mitochondria instead of uh, coronary arteries, because uh, I know at the beginning you started with injection directly in the muscle, in the in the in the, the heart, and then you pass to delivery of mitochondria in uh, in the coronary arteries. You think also will will be possible to inject in the intravenously the, the mitochondria mm -hmm. to have some uh, location of mitochondria in the in the myocytes? We, um, okay, well, first off on how many do you need? In the heart, we need two times 10 to the fifth, two times 10 to the sixth per gram wet weight. Um, we've done this over and over again. It, as I say, more doesn't hurt. 
uh, less does, obviously. Um, we've, we've found that we have to, the mitochondria are really homeboys. They go to the next organ. We have had no luck uh, intravenously. We've spent uh, literally thousands of dollars radio labeling these mitochondria, trying to put them in uh, IV, and they just stay where they are. Uh, if you put them into the coronary arteries, they go just to the lung. We've shown that uh, full body images. If you put them in for renal, they only go to the kidneys. If you put them into the pulmonary artery, only lung. The pulmonary, we can also put them in by a nebulizer or ventilator and they go to the lung and of course the bronchus. Um, we have not been able to get them into the brain. We've tried everything. Um, we tried carotid injection, and even in uh, uh, animals that have been severely, severely concussed, we were able to get, unable to get them past the blood-brain barrier. Interestingly, uh, as you know, the eye, the brain, the placenta, you're not supposed to get, uh, be able to pass. When we tied off the, uh, when we did deliver the mitochondria, they went into the eye. Um, so they all shot through the external carotid rather than the internal carotid and went, went directly into the eye. So maybe later on there is some way to get them up to the brain, but we have not found that. Right now we're using them for pediatric patients uh, who have experienced ischemia reperfusion injury. They've been on ECMO for greater than three days, and those are our patient population. We have a study that's coming up with uh, Houston Methodist for the DCD heart and the DCD heart preservation. And we hope that'll work out very well. Okay. Uh, Don, uh, have the final question for you. In, uh, uh, you imagine the, to use uh, in clinical setting uh, the gene transduction uh, uh, just to prevent uh, coronary disease, that's right? In, uh, uh, do you think it will be possible to use uh, this technique uh, in the future just to uh, make uh, some uh, immunomodulation uh, of the organ? I mean, uh, like in, uh, it, it is possible, it has, made, it has been made in, xeno, in xenotransplantation, you know, it has been modified the expression of antigens. Do you think it will be possible also in, uh, in the organ, uh, preserve uh, maybe in OCS, uh, you can make uh, some kind of the transaction uh, and uh, modify the expression uh, of antigens in, in such organ. Um, no, I, I, I think that that might be um, uh, very, uh, very plausible. Um, um, you're, you're, you're thinking about uh, perhaps uh, CRISPR technology to um, reduce MHC expression, um, eliminate MHC expression, that, that, that type of thing. I think that that would, um, uh, this technology could probably be adapted for that kind of, uh, um, for that kind of application. Usually the, the, the gene transduction uh, is, uh, is possible uh, in uh, normothermic technique, I mean, uh, non uh, in uh, hypothermic technique. In, we, uh, we, we feel the benefit of the uh, ex vivo normothermic perfusion is exactly that. It's, more, it's a more conducive environment for the, uh, the, viral, vector uh, the viral vector attachment up key, you know, uptake, um, you know, going through and starting its life cycle. Um, you know, right at the very beginning, as opposed to cold static storage, where it's more, uh, more it's static, so the virus isn't going to be as effective as well. Do you think uh, is uh, this technique is compatible with the usual time, uh, you know, allowed uh, uh, with uh, OCS preservation? It, that we, means I, in, in four or five hours uh, will be possible. The, so we've used two hours um, experimentally, but we've also um, acquired samples over time points, uh, over these time points from the OCS solution, uh, from the OCS system, and we have a cell-based assay, and we find uh, almost 100% uptake within oh. about 60 minutes. So, um, you know, two hours would be sufficient. Um, I don't, I can't, I can't imagine, you know, five or more hours would be a bad thing, I think it would be a good thing. 
for this. Great. Dr. Summer, have you the last question? I think we, we, we kind of have to wrap up the discussion. It's been really, really interesting. Um, um, I think you would like to ask all the uh, participants to answer a quick poll um, that will appear soon on everybody's screen. Um, maybe you can just um, answer this. Um, and then I think we will all be happy to see each other in person again um, at the end of August um, at the annual meeting. That sounds great. I think, uh, uh, Dr. Summer, we have to, to close uh, this session because uh, the time is over. I would like to, uh, to, to thank uh, uh, all the speakers uh, for the very interesting talks uh, this afternoon. We would like to ask the participants to answer a quick poll uh, as we've done. ISOT has prepared more exciting webinars in upcoming weeks, so please make sure to register on the Congress website. This is uh, the next one you can see on the screen. We hope to see you, all of you in Milan at the end of August, and we encourage you to, regis to register to the Congress. Thank you, Dr. Summer, for moderating this webinar with me. Thank you for all attendees and uh, all the speakers. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you to all the um, panelists and, and attendees. Have a good night. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Good evening. Bye.